Um, so do you want to talk about what's been happening with the, the Git transition uh, since the last pause? Yeah, that's a great uh, a great topic. Uh, so for any folks who haven't been following FreeBSD that closely, um, we switched to Git as our canonical repo as sort of the source of truth for all three of our primary project repositories um, within the last uh, year and a bit. Um, so that's the source tree, the documentation tree, and the ports tree. Um, we had been using Subversion um, prior to the migration, and uh, prior to that, we were using CVS. So um, we're on our third iteration of uh, source control tool for FreeBSD uh, over the project's uh, decades of, of history. Um, and our primary sort of goal in migrating to Git was to participate uh, more, more readily in the sort of environment that newer contributors are used to. Um, so uh, in today's world, many developers and potential contributors to FreeBSD are, are, most of them are already familiar with Git. They understand how the tools work. Um, they know how to, to interact with, uh, um, with Git patches and, and projects using Git. So our goal really was to sort of meet them where they already know how to, to operate. Um, and many of the long-term FreeBSD contributors, um, uh, certainly the most prolific FreeBSD contributors over the last while, were already using Git in their own internal development practices um, based off the, the mirror of the Subversion repository. Um, Mark, anything else you'd like to add on that? I mean, I, I think you captured most of it. it. It's like you said, most of us were using Git well before the transition. Um, switching officially has helped streamline things a lot. It helps a lot with um, downstream forks of FreeBSD. So commercial users that maintain a fork or, or downstream projects that maintain some sort of open source FreeBSD distribution. Um, because now they're they're not relying on this mirror, which you know occasionally breaks or or has to be um, yeah, you need, need to like a force push to, to clean things up. Um, it makes it easier to take patches from contributors directly. They, they just post a Git branch somewhere, uh, uh, a patch, and there's no kind of manual munging needed in order to apply it. So I think it's, it's, it's not been a revolutionary change. I think day to day, it's, it's hasn't changed a whole lot for the, for the core developers, but, uh, uh, it, it streamlines everything quite a lot, and I think it's it's going to enable uh, um, a lot more improvements going down the road. And Joe, um, any experience maybe from the port side that um, that you you've seen from the Git transition? Um, I think in general it's been a relatively smooth transition. There's a, a lot of little features that are nice. So in the past, uh, committers were sort of gatekeepers for the repository and people would submit patches and, and then a developer would have to uh, submit, like can push that patch to the repository. Now uh, the tools are a little bit more streamlined and the uh, contributor gets uh, recognition. When you do a git log, you'll see that the person that submitted the patch gets attributed for their work. Um, other than that, I think it's, as Mark said, it's not a really revolutionary change. Um, you get a lot of the nice features from Git, like uh, distributed workflows and working offline, uh, local branches. Um, Other things are changing too. Uh, do you want to talk about the documentation changes and, and things that have uh, moved forward there? Uh, FreeBSD has uh, is well known for having um, good documentation and and for a long time has put a lot of effort into um, the, the documentation that we provide for the operating system. So the FreeBSD handbook and various guides and things. Um, historically, that documentation was, um, uh, was created using a technology called DocBook, which um, is maybe a little bit cumbersome and hard to approach for, for new folks. So um, this year, uh, We've had a migration to uh, reformatting all of the documentation into ASCII doc, um, and uh, basically making it more approachable and and more readily editable um, for for people who want to contribute. Uh, it's from a end user perspective, looking at the document, looking at the documentation on the website and such. Um, you know, it's it's sort of a lot of work that didn't doesn't really have a 
particularly noticeable um, effect, uh, at least the change itself. I mean, the documentation is the same content and looks the same, at least uh, when the conversion was first done. Uh, but one of the nice things about it is is that um, the tooling allows for some you know, some improvements from there. So, for example, if you look at the FreeBSD documentation website now, um, there's been a, a bit of effort that's gone into reformatting it, and so it, it presents a um, a much sort of nicer, fresher look now than um, than what it historically had been. You want to talk about what's going on with like Fabricator and, and such? Sure. So Fabricator is an open source code review system. Um, I mean, it's actually quite a bit larger than that. It, it's kind of got a complete developer suite, issue tracker, and, and a number of other facilities. But we, we mostly make use of it for, um, for doing online code reviews. Um, so in the past year, I, I don't think we've seen a lot of actual changes. We've been using Fabricator for about, I would say, four or five years at this point. Um, but with the, with the transition to Git, it's been easier to build tooling around um, some, some aspects of Fabricator uh, just to make contributor and developer workflows smoother, you know, uh, making it easy to uh, upload, uh, upload commits as, as reviews and tagging the right people and, and making sure that um, appropriate reviewers get tagged when, uh, when a patch is submitted. Um, so I think that's, that's really reduced the friction for, for contributors as well. I mean, I, I remember the days of working on FreeBSD before that. Usually, I would, you know, I'd have a patch and I'd write an email to to one or several people, or perhaps a mailing list, asking them to review. And, and doing that over and over again was kind of onerous. Um, so, I mean, obviously, there's there's lots of different uh, code review systems out there, email based ones, and so on. But I think Fabricator is, you know, while not perfect, has definitely uh, improved the quality of life for for FreeBSD developers and contributors. Um, and we, we make use of it across, you know, not, not just the source tree, but also ports and uh, um, and the docs tree as well. Yeah, and one one sort of note to uh, carry on from there, um, the FreeBSD core team has had some uh, ongoing discussions um, uh, around workflow changes that we can build on top of um, the Git transition and uh, code review and um, CI hosted CI tools like Cirrus CI. Um, uh, there's not an awful lot um, sort of the, to to show from this just yet, but the discussions are ongoing, and we're we're looking at how to better support uh, pre-commit CI and uh, workflow improvements. There have been some other improvements in FreeBSD that I think enable uh, enable those kinds of things going forward, like. We're perhaps going to talk about that a bit later, but uh, it recently became possible to build FreeBSD on Linux and Mac OS. Um, so that really opens a lot of things up because, I mean, a lot of hosted CI services don't really provide, you know, native FreeBSD builders, um, Cirrus CI being, being a notable exception. But um, I think being able to build um, in, a, in a Linux environment is, is quite useful uh, uh, for, for quite a lot of contributors and, and downstreams. Uh, so I'm, I'm pretty excited to see that continue evolving. Other workflow changes. It's not a workflow change, but I mean, we've we've also been um, making quite heavy use of, of post commit CI, um, and, that, and that's expanded quite a bit in the in the past couple of years. Um, not only do we run the FreeBSD regression test suite, but we you know we run with various sanitizers enabled. We run um, Linux compatibility tests, TCP tests, and other kind of specialized things uh, automatically um, when batches of commits get pushed. So those tend to find issues quite quickly, um, and and you know, more often than not, they find them before our users do, which is, of course, the goal. Uh, so I, I, I think that's going to continue to be uh, an important part of, of our development process, even though we'd like to do a lot of that testing before commits get pushed. Yeah, I think that's a good um, a good segue, uh, maybe, into from the sanitizers um, into the work that you've been doing with SysCaller. Uh, do you want to talk about that for a moment? Oh yeah, that's so. That's another, I, I guess, yeah, CI-related topic. So SysCaller is a, is a system call fuzzer uh, developed by uh, Dimitri Vukov at uh, Google, um, and so it basically generates random programs that uh, invoke system calls and runs them, collects coverage information from the kernel, and basically continues doing that in a loop until it 
find something that crashes the kernel. Um, so it's found thousands and thousands of bugs across basically all major operating systems. Um, you know, it supports all of the all of the BSDs, um, uh, Linux, of course. I think uh, some folks are using it to fuzz Darwin, and um, you know, other other OS like projects like GVisor. Um, so it's been enormously successful, and and uh, Google's been uh, kind enough to to run a public instance that continually fuzzes FreeBSD and Linux and, and other operating systems, uh, and, and generates email when it finds a bug. Um, so that that's been enormously useful. We've been able to catch quite a few bugs um, in short order uh, as a result of that. Uh, so I, I've done some work to make sure that syscaller is um, kind of reaching as much of the kernel as possible in the sense that you know, it knows about all of our system calls. It has ways to generate code, which, which uh, exercises rarely, rarely executed code paths where bugs tend to lurk, especially security related ones. Um, so that's found hundreds of bugs in FreeBSD. Those also get fixed pretty quickly. Um, Syscaller is quite good in that it generates reproducers for most of the bugs that it finds, so you can debug them rather easily. Um, and in the past year, we also ported several kernels, kernel sanitizers from uh, NetBSD, um, in particular, the address sanitizer, memory sanitizer, and those, those complement Syscaller quite well, uh, just because they, they tend to catch bugs um, a bit more easily than, than they would otherwise. So, Whereas before you might have a double free that leads to some memory corruption that eventually triggers your kernel panic with sanitizers enabled, you catch that much earlier. And so the bug needs to be applied. Um, but I think as far as stability goes in general, FreeBSD has really uh, improved a lot in the past uh, year or two as a result of this work. It could be worth mentioning here that uh, if you have a sponsorship uh, with the RISC-V uh, Community uh, Risk Five International uh, to support uh, Syscaller on FreeBSD Risk Five. So there's there's been interest around this kind of newish architecture Risk Five, and uh, fingers crossed we'll have uh, support for Syscaller after this sponsorship. So maybe mid 2022. Yeah, that that would be really great. Right now. Um... Uh, Syscaller supports fuzzing the AMD64 architecture as well as um, our 32-bit compatibility layer there. So other platforms like uh, RISC-V and, and ARM64 currently aren't fuzzed, but that would obviously be very desirable for us. So I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing that project uh, make some progress. I can't say too much about the details, but I'm uh, interested in the boot time improvements that Colin Percival has been working on. I know he's been doing uh, iterative changes there very carefully as you know uh, it's kind of a trade-off uh, with having a reliable boot and, and a fast boot sometimes but uh, I know Colin's been very careful to add minor changes here and there and uh, I'm looking forward to those making it into a stable release. Yeah that's a, um, a great point. Colin has been working on um, uh, finding sources of uh, uh, delays in our boot process and sort of iteratively um, removing them. So it's, you know, 100 milliseconds saved here, 500 milliseconds saved there, um, and pretty soon it starts adding up to real time. Uh, but it uh, it's it's largely um, either you know delays uh, delays in the boot process while waiting for hardware probes um, or things that were not parallelized or um, uh, Sort of time uh, time calibration delays that were much longer than um, they needed to be. All kinds of um, all kinds of, of issues scattered across a variety of subsystems. Uh, I think the uh, I'm not sure what the net net result is, but it, it's been a huge savings in the um, uh, the boot time from the kernel starting um, through to uh, the user land starting up. Uh, I think it's it, it's it's many many seconds that have been been saved off, uh, and I think we're we're less than half of the the time that we started. I don't know if Mark, if you have the. It's it's certainly very noticeable, um, especially when you do things like developing a VM and you're frequently rebooting it um, to test kernel changes. It it really adds up, um, and it's I mean, it's just satisfying to you know boot up my laptop and, and have everything kind of fly by when I know a few years ago it was significantly slower. It 
fits in well with uh, the foundation's technology roadmap that includes uh, improvements to the laptop desktop experience. So uh, when you're you know, at a conference with your laptop and you're rebooting frequently, it's nice to save a few seconds. Yeah, so Colin is, um, is doing that work under a Patreon that he's uh, um, collecting sponsorships for. I'm just looking at the stats on the wiki page at the moment and I see, um, so he, he, Colin started um, by analyzing 11.1 uh, release, which was uh, 28,208 milliseconds. Um, so 28 seconds and then um, 14 current at the time that he tested it um, was 9,401, so about nine and a half seconds. So that's a, a huge uh, reduction in, in boot time. I think that's also motivated others to, to look at related problems. I mean, um, I saw that Alexander Moten recently committed some changes to improve shutdown times. We were spending a, a whole bunch of time kind of uselessly waiting for threads to park before shutting down and let's fix that, um, which is also a pretty big improvement as long as you're actually shutting down your machine properly. Um, so. Yeah, there's, and, there's a lot of nice improvements. And there's probably um, lots of uh, work to come on user land boot time uh, improvements uh, next, uh, the next step. Right. So the, the nice thing about Colin's work is that he also has this framework for, for actually measuring this thing. So you don't have to, you know, take a single machine and, and uh, instrument it carefully and then and try to optimize that. You can uh, use this generalized tracing framework to, to get a flame graph that shows you know where each individual system is, is spending time and, and can optimize accordingly. Um, so some you know newer systems were tending to waste a lot of time calibrating using the uh, the Intel 8254 programmable intro or uh, interval timer, and uh, you know that that's the sort of thing that might show up as as a hotspot on on some systems but not others. So you know being able to uh, explore boot times on your own machine. And compare them with with others is uh, is really handy. Let's talk about uh, a big one here. Um, let's talk about ARM sixty four becoming tier one. So that is a uh, a big item. Um, the FreeBSD project first started um, with ARM sixty four many many years ago when Andy Turner um, started exploring it, uh, exploring the architecture as, just as a member of the FreeBSD community. Um, and then the FreeBSD Foundation stepped in, stepped in to help uh, uh, by sponsoring his work and collaborating with um, ARM and uh, Cavium at the time to help sort of improve the, the state of the ARM64 port. Um, and that's progressed to the point where the, the core team agreed um, last year to promote ARM64 to tier one. So at this point, the 64-bit x86 and ARM architectures are the tier one architectures in FreeBSD, uh, which means that they're the architectures for which we provide security updates and make sure that binary packages are, are available and release images are available and, and sort of um, uh, that the security team will support and, um, and provide us a, a quality, um, uh, quality release. So, uh, I think it's it's been a long time um, coming, and I think as ARM64 really sort of increases in interest and viability, um, you know, we've seen ARM64 becoming increasingly prevalent in uh, data center use in in cloud environments, um, and so it's it's really important that FreeBSD is is available and and just works um, in those environments. Um, there's still still a bit of a gap, I think, for ARM64 sort of developer workstation desktop type environments. Um, they're, they're a little bit more limited, um, but there's definitely interest in the community uh, in supporting those. So um, although they're, the support is, is not fully fleshed out at this point, um, things like Raspberry Pi 4 uh, work with FreeBSD and, and you know, I think there's definitely an interest in, in continuing um, continuing to improve on Raspberry Pi and, and on uh, platforms like the Pine64 or, um, or other ARM64 embedded boards. Um, but as far as the architecture itself is concerned, uh, FreeBSD ARM64 is, is tier one and packages and uh, security updates and everything just work. Anything else to add on those? 
Um, nothing really. I mean, it's it's just very nice to be able to use Graviton uh, to. I, I use that quite a lot whenever I want to spin up uh, cloud instances because they they run FreeBSD very quickly. Um, we've done some work to. We, we've done some performance work on the ARM64 port as a result of benchmarking on on that platform, and just having that available very easily is, is definitely a great thing. What about um, what's going on with OpenZFS and the changes there? Uh, so in 13.0, we switched um, our ZFS upstream, or I guess I should say ZFS, um, from Illumos to uh, to OpenZFS, which is or which was formerly the uh, ZFS on Linux project, um, but now supports both Linux and and FreeBSD. Um, so ZFS on Linux had quite a few improvements um, that were that were lacking in FreeBSD. Um, I can't really speak to the to the particulars of that. Um, I'm not, I'm not much of a ZFS power user. I, I, my experience with it is, is fairly basic, um, but it definitely enabled uh, you know a lot of a lot of workflows on FreeBSD that weren't possible before. Um, and OpenZFS also just at this point is is a much more active upstream for us. Uh, you know, there's a lot of contributors from different companies and, and lots of individuals who are submitting you know bug fixes, cleanups, performance enhancements. Um, if you look at their their GitHub page, it's it's quite active. Um, I've been able to submit patches myself and, and get timely reviews and, and merges, which is uh, which is of course very nice. Um, so it's been a really pleasant upstream to interact with, um, as as far as you know, being a FreeBSD developer goes. Um, so uh, I, I think that's that's gone quite well. Yeah, I think one way to, to look at it sort of is in in the past, uh, Illumos was the upstream for the project, and we were a downstream consumer and sort of maintain our own port of it. Whereas with OpenZFS, uh, in, in effect, uh, it's not really necessarily an upstream uh, for us in the same way. It's it's that both Linux and FreeBSD now use this shared common uh, code base that we collaborate on. And, and OpenZFS basically just, instead of being the upstream, it, it is the ZFS that's in FreeBSD and in Linux. Uh, let's talk about the what the foundation sponsored uh, recently and uh, what's happening there. How about with Wi-Fi? Sure, we'll start off with Wi-Fi because it's a um, a common uh, common thread of interest. Um, so for for quite some time, I think the foundation um, has received FreeBSD Foundation has received feedback that Wi-Fi is uh, an important gap um, in FreeBSD and, and is really limiting. FreeBSD's use as a developer platform uh, on laptops and such. Um, and so we've been sponsoring Bjorn Zeeb uh, to, for a number of, of Wi-Fi improvements um, and the sort of starting off with a migration to the, um, the Intel uh, shared BS, uh, dual licensed IWL Wi-Fi drivers um, that are also used in the Linux kernel for, their, for Intel's contemporary Wi-Fi um, Wi-Fi cards, Wi-Fi interfaces. So this uh, this work is in the tree now and is available. There's still sort of ongoing work to um, to get it uh, fully stable and, and usable, um, but it is it is in the tree now and uh, supports the um, uh, the Intel uh, Wi-Fi NICs in contemporary laptops. Um, Mark, I don't know if you want to say a little bit about it from the context of the uh, framework. Laptop, like it's it's clear at this point that a huge amount of work has gone into it, and I think there's going to be you know the usual long tail of bug fixing and, and stabilization, um, uh, you know before before everything is really seamless. But I think you know a huge a huge amount of the the required work has already been done. Um, there's quite a few users on the mailing list reporting success, and and uh, uh, it's. Uh, yeah, it's it's definitely a pretty big milestone. Yeah, I think it's um, it's fair to say that there's there's a bit of work uh, there's a bit of a bit of a road ahead of us still to um, to sorting out a, a number of issues, but uh, we're in we're in a pretty good position now um, and have a, a, a great foundation to build on to to get that last bit uh, completed. Um, let's talk about uh, what's going on with LLDB. Sure, I can say a little bit about that. Um, so LLDB is the LLVM debugger. So it's what GDB is to GCC maybe. 
and uh, the foundation has worked with Moritz Systems to improve uh, support for uh, LLDB uh, with the ultimate goal of uh, allowing kernel debugging uh, with LLDB, LLDB. And so they've, first of all, Moritz Systems has done a great job at documenting their, their work. They've divided it up into six different milestones and they describe those milestones on their on their site. Um, briefly, the the first milestone was to uh, improve compatibility with GDB. So GDB is pretty uh, ubiquitous, and there's some interfaces that other tools expect. So they're improving that that compatibility. Um, another milestone was to add support for debugging uh, by serial port. Ed or Mark, do you have uh, anything else you want to add? Uh, I guess I can just mention that um, we've been working with Moritz Systems for quite a while on a variety of um, uh, LLDB projects. So uh, they started off by migrating to the um, uh, the standalone debug scheme that LLDB uses for all of the other architectures, um, which essentially, essentially means that LLDB starts a debug server and um, runs the, the target that you're debugging underneath that debug server. Um, so it does that both for local and remote debug, um, which has a, a number of sort of nice uh, attributes, both in terms of how the debugger itself operates um, and just for testing and reliability. It means that remote debugging and local debugging um, sort of by necessity uh, work as well as well as each other and, and um, inherently get tested in, in, because remote debugging, local debugging is remote debugging um, in effect. So that was the, the first project that we started with um, and just sort of general stability improvements for LLDB on FreeBSD. Um, they started or they followed that with some improvements to various architectures, uh, as Joe mentioned. Um, and then the most recent one is, is adding support for kernel um, debugging both core files and live live kernel debugging. Um, and this work is all in upstream LLDB um, now and, and is going to be in the LL, uh, in LLVM's 14 uh, release. Maybe it's worth mentioning why. I know John Bovlin does a lot of work with GDB and, and it's uh, well used by a lot of developers. Um, why? Is it important for us to improve LLDB? I, I mean, the obvious one is the is you know, we generally have a preference within FreeBSD for permissive licenses, and, and LLDB has that. Um, uh, I think Mark or Ed would have more to say about other reasons why we feel it's good to have good support for this alternative debugger. Yeah, I mean, I think it's. Um... At the end of the day, uh, the debugger is, is something that you know is is historically a debugger has been part of FreeBSD's base system, and, and we'd like to keep that. And so, having a permissively licensed uh, debugger that's in the same family as the whole rest of the tool chain, um, you know, has some some nice uh, attributes. Um, in, in some ways, a debugger is a different sort of. Um, uh, situation than something like the compiler or linker or other parts of the tool chain um, because everyone who builds something on FreeBSD uh, who compiles software uses those other tool chain components it, it sort of affects everyone whereas the debugger is is specifically used by developers who are investigating um, crashes or other problems um, and so you know there's there's less absolute need for us to have a debugger as part of the base system or to have a permissively licensed um, debugger. But I think it is it is still something that we want to be able to have a, a full suite of, um, of tools available and having them all share the same licenses um, uh, is important. Um, as well, there are a few nice attributes about the way that LLDB works. Um, so one, one example is that it uses Clang as its expression parser. Uh, which means that any expression 
um, that you when you when you provide an expression on the debugger command line to uh, examine some variable or something like that, um, it provides a very high fidelity experience because it's actually using Clang to interpret the expression that you've um, uh, you've entered and uh, basically just in time execute the expression to to determine what it is you're trying to to find. Um, the, the comment that I made earlier about the way that LLDB operates um, with the debug server is also something that um, is, is quite nice um, and with some future work should allow us to, to provide some, um, some, more, some more friendly debugging environments, um, debugging tool uh, cases. Um, but I think at the end of the day, um, you know, people who, developers who are already familiar with GDB, um, GDB exists on FreeBSD and, and works well and, and um, you know, people are free to use it. Um, but uh, um, having LLDB available and having um, LLDB, uh, having the ability to compile LL, LLDB on other operating systems, say, and then debug um, a FreeBSD process um, using remote debugging um, is, is another kind of nice feature that um, that is uh, well supported by by LLDB. Do we want to talk about um, open SSH two-factor authorization? Sure. Um, so FreeBSD contains a copy of open SSH in the base system and is generally kept up to date on a regular cadence when upstream releases um, come out. And so that's been continuing. We have um, OpenSSH 8.8 .8 in the base system at this point, which is the, the latest release. Um, but one of the recent additions to um, OpenSSH upstream was the addition of uh, FIDO uh, slash U2F keys. Um, so things like Yuba keys, um, universal two-factor authentication um, devices. And upstream, OpenSSH added support for this um, in the, the recent past. And with the update in FreeBSD, we've enabled it in the base system as well. So this inv uh, involved adding libfido and libcbor to the, the base system to be used by OpenSSH. And SSH in the, in the base system now can use a, um, a YubiKey or a solo key or any of the other um, U2F keys uh, to authenticate to a remote uh, SSH server. So this is, this is a feature that, um, you know, people have been um, quite interested in for some time and has been available in the base or in the, in it's been available in OpenSSH in the ports collection for some time, but um, it's convenient to have it available in the base system OpenSSH that's just available out of the box as well. Well, I know, uh, Joe, you mentioned John Baldwin. Let's talk about what's going on with WireGuard. Here. There was some question about the stability and quality of the um, WireGuard implementation that was prepared for the FreeBSD tree. So the foundation um, foundation worked with John Baldwin to review the existing code and prepare um, prepare the OCF um, uh, prepare the FreeBSD kernels OCF implementation to support WireGuard's needs, so that WireGuard can just make use of the functionality that already exists. Um, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, the, the new implementation that he's been working on is quite a bit smaller um, than, than the one that was in FreeBSD previously. Um, he's had to do some quite a, quite a bit of refactoring and I think overall improvement in the, in the crypto subsystem uh, to accommodate WireGuard. So I think that's going to benefit more than, more than just WireGuard. Um, yeah, so I, I think in effect, um, John's work has um, sort of refined and improved uh, OCF in FreeBSD um, with one major outcome being that WireGuard is able to make use of those primitives um, and an in-kernel FreeBSD WireGuard is much, um, uh, much smaller and sort of more self-contained um, than it would have otherwise been because it can make yeah. use of the functionality that now exists um, in the FreeBSD kernel. And uh, John has also, so John has been working both on OCF in the FreeBSD kernel, as well as changes to uh, WireGuard to make use of the functionality that's now provided in OCF uh, and just sort of general review and improvements of the FreeBSD WireGuard um, uh, implementation. Well, let's talk about what's coming up, what's on the horizon for, uh, for FreeBSD. 
Um, I know another big item that's gotten some news recently, the uh, Morello, the Cherry Morello project out of Cambridge and an arm. So somebody want to highlight that? Yeah, so I think this is a really interesting project um, that is not FreeBSD per se, but one in which FreeBSD plays a, a really big part. Um, so the, the Cherry project um, is an extension of uh, processor instruction set architectures, uh, ISAs, to support capabilities. Um, and there's just a lot to go into to kind of try and explain um, uh, the background there. Um, and I think the, the best, uh, we're not gonna be able to cover it in, in a few moments here, um, but uh, in effect, uh, capability is sort of an unforgeable, um, uh, you can think of it as um, a pointer uh, that's extended to be, um, to have additional information, i.e. Uh, uh, a length and, and bounded limit. Um, and it's an unforgeable um, token that allows access to the memory that it references. Um, there's, there's lots beyond that, um, but one of the keys is that it provides sort of guaranteed um, spatial safe, sp spatial memory safety. Um, so it's, you know, if you have a capability that references some piece of memory, there is no way to use that to access anything outside of the, the memory that it, it references. Um, and so the, the Cherry um, research project at the University of Cambridge started with um, a derivative of the MIPS ISA for, um, for their initial research and uh, has been extended to provide implementations for uh, ARM64 and RISC-V as well. But the Morello project is, is particularly interesting um, because this is work that ARM itself has done to actually fabricate a physical, um, uh, a physical CPU um, using uh, uh, Morello, which is the, the um, experimental ARM64 implementation of, of Cherry capabilities. And so this is a 64-bit um, ARM CPU uh, with capability register extensions um, that can run uh, FreeBSD, uh, Cherry BSD, which is the um, which is the FreeBSD derivative that the, the Cherry folks have created um, that provides a, a fully capability enabled um, uh, kernel. And these these systems are starting to ship um, uh, to researchers. Uh, the, the initial systems have shipped to to Cambridge, and and additional systems are shipping to various researchers looking to use this, um, looking to to continue their their research on this this platform. Um, what else uh, is coming up? What's what's up with Beehive and ARM64? So this is uh, on our roadmap um, for foundation sponsored work that um, uh, Andy Turner can take on. Um, so Andy works for the foundation um, on a variety of ARM64 things. And one of the tasks that we have on the, the plan um, is to help support the efforts to integrate um, uh, the 64-bit ARM support that exists for Beehive. So there are patches that exist today um, to add 64-bit ARM Beehive support, um, but there's there's some work that needs to be done just to get them into an integratable state and resolve some outstanding issues. And so that's uh, one of the, the next tasks that will, um, will be on Andy's plate and uh, allow us to um, allow us to run Beehive um, on all of our tier one architectures. What other upcoming things do you want to discuss today? There's plenty, <laughs> given the roadmap that you mentioned and such. Um, so I think one thing we can we can talk about or mention at least is that uh, Free, the FreeBSD Foundation's work on Wi-Fi uh, will continue. So in addition to finishing up the remaining steps um, on sort of just stabilizing and integrating the IWL Wi-Fi support for Intel um, uh, next, there's drivers for additional uh, additional devices and enabling 802.11 and an 802.11 AC um, and future Wi-Fi uh, standards within the FreeBSD Wi-Fi stack. Um, so that's uh, that's work that's that's in progress and on the foundation's um, uh, roadmap already. And we've also been talking to Morris Systems to continue their work on LLBB. 
Uh, it's in the early stages and nothing's finalized yet, but some of the uh, possible improvements or further improvements to LLTB would be multi-process support. Uh, we discussed a few more uh, usability improvements. Um, perhaps some lower priorities that were discussed were support for risk five or tracing syscalls similar to S-Trace or Trust. Uh, well, that's a lot <laughs> just going around. Uh, are there more things that uh, you want to mention uh, before we wrap up? I think I think one thing we should try and talk about here a little bit is just um, the kind of renewed interest in FreeBSD as a desktop. Um, uh, I think that is something that um, uh, historically FreeBSD was uh, sort of very well known as a server operating system, um, and people have been running FreeBSD on a desktop uh, for for quite some time. But it's it's kind of um, uh, grown and waned in popularity over over time. And I think um, a few years ago, there was very much perception that uh, FreeBSD developers don't use FreeBSD on their own laptops. You know, there, there was comments at um, uh, conferences and such that the FreeBSD developers were all using Macs and such. Um, and I don't think that was ever fully true, um, but certainly uh, it's cer certainly there's been a, um, a strong growth in the number of developers who use FreeBSD as their day-to-day -day, um, day -day desktop environment, their daily driver. Um, so I've been using FreeBSD as my desktop for, for years and years. Um, I think everyone on this, this call, um, uh, Mark and, and Joe uses uh, FreeBSD as their, their primary uh, desktop environment. Um, and I think that there's been an interest in in sort of FreeBSD um, as a desktop that's um, that's always been there, but has grown in the community um, uh, again over time. And we see this also with um, with proje uh, projects like GhostBSD or Hello System um, that try to build desktop environments. Um, the closest thing I guess we would have to a distro in the FreeBSD world um, uh, that build on FreeBSD. And try to package uh, FreeBSD as a ready-to-use, um, pleasant desktop environment. Yeah, we've been getting quite a lot of development effort in kind of desktop-oriented, uh, you know, device drivers. So I mean, there's a huge amount of work that goes into maintaining ports of the DRM graphics drivers from Linux, and those work very well on contemporary hardware, like on you know, um, my my framework laptop, which runs FreeBSD, uses uh, has has a uh, Tiger Lake, or is it Tiger Lake? I can't quite remember the name anymore. Um, one of Intel's silly names. One of the lakes. Um, one of the lakes. Tiger Lake, yes. Uh, so that, that works flawlessly on, on at least uh, the development branch. I haven't had any graphics problems. Um, similarly, uh, a number of my AMD GPUs, uh, fairly recent ones, uh, all, all work properly with FreeBSD. Um, uh, Vladimir Konaturev has been working on um, uh, touchpad drivers, in particular, um, uh, hit devices that use uh, I squared C as a transport, um, which has been uh, pretty common among laptops uh, for the past few years. So, um, having having first class support for that has been uh, has been great for anyone looking to run FreeBSD on a modern laptop. And I'll mention that it's nice that the DRM work for for. Uh, modern graphics support hasn't sacrificed support for some fairly old devices. I'm running, I think it's, we have two laptops here running FreeBSD. I think one's Ivy Bridge and one's Sandy Bridge and the, the DRM uh, FreeBSD ports work fine. They're just, just install them and go. I'm Brooks Davis. I work for SRI International and we've been uh, working with the University of Cambridge for uh, a little over a decade now on uh, the Cherry project. So tell me a little bit about uh, the background and what, what Cherry involves. So Cherry, Cherry is, a, is a, hardware, a hardware feature um, that's portable across instruction set architectures uh, that provides spatial memory safety um, inherently by adding bounds to pointers um, and integrity to pointers. And then we can, 
using the properties of Cherry, we can implement temporal memory safety so we can eliminate um, use after reallocation type errors. And then Cherry also makes it possible um, to provide extremely efficient compartmentalization. So orders of magnitude, more efficient domain switching um, between compartments than say uh, the process-based compartmentalization in your web browser. All right, and you mentioned that this has been in progress for a long time and is portable across different uh, ISAs. Um, can you sort of describe briefly what, um, what ISAs have been targeted? Well, so we, we started out um, targeting MIPS. It was the, the open-ish 64-bit uh, architecture um, that was available uh, a decade ago. Um, and uh, so we started there, we ported FreeBSD to it, um, and that's CherryBSD. Um, and then, and we did that with uh, DARPA funding under the Crash and MRC programs, um, where we were really trying to do a clean slate security um, changes. So the, the goal was if you could replace some major thing um, and make security greatly better, um, you know, what could you do? And Cherry was our idea. So, um, yeah, so we ported Cherry BSD to that. And then with about, we had some continuing funding. And then about four years ago, uh, DARPA Sith started. And DARPA Sith um, was built, was a similar idea of, uh, you know, make a, a big leap forward in uh, technology, um, in security technology. And uh, there we were targeting risk five. Um, and, that, and that was all public. But then about a year or so ago, we got to announce that we'd actually been working with ARM since 2014 um, on uh, a new, uh, on porting the, uh, porting Cherry to uh, the ARMv8 architecture. Um, and the, the manifestation of that is Morello, which uh, we just announced boards uh, in the last week and week, week and a half. Excellent. So I'd like to get to Morello in, in just a moment, but uh, first I'd like to talk a little bit about Cherry BSD and if you can kind of describe um, how that relates to the, the FreeBSD project, um, what's, uh, what's the same and what's different in Cherry BSD versus FreeBSD? Um, yeah, so, so the, the big difference is that in Cherry BSD, um, all pointers in user space are uh, Cherry capabilities, which means they're unforgeable, they have uh, tightly set bounds, and we really implement the idea of least privilege, the principle of least privilege at um, the pointer level in the in the program. So we we really express with the language um, the intent of the program, the programmer's intent through the language, um, and take that all the way down to the hardware. So we eliminate lots of buffer overflows uh, for something timely. Um, we would eliminate virtually every step along the way of exploiting the recent uh, Polykit uh, uh, vulnerability um, that sat in, in Unix for 14 years. There is no way that almost any of the bugs in the in the system could could have affect us. Uh, and then, so so all of user space has been pure has been what we call pure capability, where all pointers are capabilities for quite some time. A more recent addition, about two years ago, is that we also have a pure capability kernel, um, where all pointers in the kernel are our capabilities. Um, we've found and continue to find a number of very minor sort of bugs um, along the way. It turns out that, for instance, you can often forget to null terminate um, arrays of pointers um, because you'll hit a null sometime <laughs> um, you know, you, you, before you walk off a page boundary. So um, we've been bumping into some small things, and uh, Jessica has been committing fixes lately um, as a result of our Morello breakup. Um, so uh, you said uh, committing some things into FreeBSD. So how um, how does that process work for sort of um, as a downstream project, um, bringing in new FreeBSD changes into CherryBSD and bringing in um, changes from CherryBSD back into FreeBSD? Um, so let's see. So so the FreeBSD changes pr process. Um, we recently had a well the last year or so we had a big stall. We finally we're finally nearly caught up. Um, in an ideal world, we merge changes in about once a week. Um, from uh, from FreeBSD mains FreeBSD's main branch, and uh, we merge them we merge them one change at a time in Git. So every every commit to the main line we merge as a single merge um, to enable us to bisect changes because it's sometimes possible. And I think Ed was one of the first people to suffer from this uh, quite a long time ago as a consultant. Um, that uh, um, it'll be the case that you'll have a change that compiles and works, but something has changed. Um, and 
now it well now it no longer works even though it compiles and, and seems like it should work mm -hmm. um, so so we do we do that um, for the most part that goes pretty well although we have quite a lot of changes especially uh, to support the uh, the kernel uh, so, so there's it there um, our upstreaming strategy is pretty much well it's a bit in fits and starts um, but uh, generally as we find changes that are general improvements um, better, better expressiveness, um, better clarity in the code, we'll try to upstream those things. Also just things where uh, the changes we need for Cherry make the system um, clearer, have clearer distinctions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as, as FreeBSD, like any long running code base, some things were written uh, back you know, when there was one architecture and uh, things evolved from there and maybe not always the right way. So we've, we, we like to push cleanups when we can. Um, and sort of in, in general or in, in broad terms, um, what would, how would you describe sort of the, the scale or scope of changes? In, what makes Cherry be like, what is the, the, the size of Cherry BSD's changes relative to FreeBSD? Um, let's see, I, I don't have the numbers right in front of me at the moment, um, but uh, I think in the kernel, we're at a percent or two, and that's in terms of lines of, lines of code change. That's quite high, and that's because the kernel is actually both a peer capability program, which requires some changes in structure to make sure that rather than manufacturing addresses out of nowhere, um, we derive pointers from other pointers. Um, that requires some changes, but hybrid takes a ton of changes because in the hybrid mode, some pointers, which is to say all pointers to the user space, are capabilities. So that requires annotations to flow down through the code base, and that's, that's the source of lots of our changes. Um, in user space, I believe we're below 1%. Um, and a study recently done um, using Cherry BSD to bring up a very basic desktop stack um, ended up with, I think, 0.2% changes, um, possibly lower than that. So uh, very, I think 0.02% changes actually on a basic KDE stack. So, so relatively non-intrusive or very non-intrusive for, for your user land. Uh applications yeah so for, for your model. for your average developer um it's quite unintrusive um mm -hmm. people writing systems code do more things that require change um older cardier code requires more change uh kernels obviously have a lot more more low level stuff so there are more things that need small changes mm -hmm. All right, um, and then uh, let's get um, on to Morello because there's, uh, as you mentioned, there's been um, a pretty exciting recent announcement. So um, tell me a little bit about uh, what Morello entails. Yeah, so the, the Morello project is a project funded by the UK government um, to provide, uh, well, to, to break the deadlock um, for a new hardware feature. One of the problems with a big new hardware feature is that software people don't want to spend a lot of work uh, characteristic, we don't want to spend a lot of work um, to support a piece of hardware that doesn't exist. And hardware people are reluctant to make massive changes that, that you know, where they have to do serious work to make the pipelines continue to function the way they want and whatnot. Um, they're reluctant to do that if they're not convinced the hardware people will do it. And, you know, any development team that's been around long enough has been burned once or twice where they, you know, did, implemented a big feature and software is like, eh, maybe not. Yeah. Um, so, so we don't, people are reluctant to make this big change. Um, and so we're trying to sort of break that, that barrier by um, the UK government funded this test chip along with ARM. So Morello is, takes the, the ARM uh, N1 CPU design um, that you'll see in things like Graviton um, or in the Oracle Computing Cloud um, and has added Cherry to it. So now we've got a, a real production superscalar uh, core with Cherry, Cherry features running at, I think, 1.5 gigahertz, which was the target frequency. Um, mm -hmm. And we've got real boards up and running. Excellent. Um, and so, um, uh, so how long has, has, it been, um, has it been running uh, where we're at today? Well, so we got we got the first um, we got the first run of Cherry BSD uh, going in early December on hardware we had remote access to at ARM, mm 
Mm -hmm. um, and we got first boards in our hands um, about a week and a half ago. Excellent. Uh, anything uh, interesting from the, the 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 bring up? Is it uh, going according to plan, or is it uh, is it uh, a difficult um, slog? I think it's going it's going pretty smoothly. Um, mm -hmm. We had we've had uh, Andrea, Andy and Rosalind working for us for a long time, uh, making sure everything was in place. We had access to a in our model of the of the uh, system on chip, so that helped a lot. We did we did encounter some bugs. Um, here and there as we started bringing in more real device drivers. Um, and there's lots of subtle things we're trying to, we're, we're currently actually trying to understand how we can make sure that, for instance, device drivers don't have, you know, lack of terminated lists and things. Um, how, 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 can we, how can we make that maintainable without having to have a Morello board with that hardware in it? Yeah, so I think there, there are some open questions there that we're thinking about in terms of what can we do to make FreeBSD more robust in this regard? Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, how um, how widely available are there? Are they rather? Are people in the FreeBSD community uh, able to to buy one? Um, so you can't buy one. You, know, you can't you know go to a, go to Amazon and buy one. Um, but uh, you can contact your ARM rep, and uh, if you've got a project, you are likely to be able to get access to one. Um, the I know the foundation is supposed to be getting a couple of them. Um, University of Cambridge will have quite a few. Um, so, so the idea being developers that developers may well be able to find access. Uh, one actually one exciting recent development is that uh, uh, Andrew Turner recently got um, the Morel Cherry BSD running a pure capability kernel in user space booted in Beehive. So we're mm -hmm. going to be able to provide virtual access. Excellent. Uh, so there, it's it's unlikely that you'll be able to put one under your desk uh, as a, a FreeBSD community member, but um, but it's it's quite likely that through the foundation or through other ways, um, you will be able to get access to one and, and do some experimentation if if there's a um, a useful path to to do that. Yeah, I think there's definitely space there, and I, as far as I know, a, a reasonable number of boards aren't aren't currently allocated. So. Um, you'd probably be looking about a year out to get your hands on one um, <laughs> due to the somewhat hands-on manufacturing process. Is there anything else um, you think is worth mentioning in in the overall Cherry uh, Morello Cherry BSD arena? Uh, I could ask you about um, uh, temporal safety, um, perhaps. Sure. Yeah. So uh, temporal safety. Um, so one of the so you know Cher Cherry puts bounds on pointers and those are unforgeable and when you and they're checked every time you do a load, um, it doesn't have a classic property of mini capability systems that um, it's trivial to revoke a capability um, by removing it from a table somewhere because one of the key design points of Cherry is that there aren't any tables, um, so we want so that and there aren't isn't privileged manipulation of of capabilities because. You obviously don't want to be able to want don't want to have to call into the kernel every time you increment a pointer. That would be insane. Um, so, uh, um, so because so we needed to overcome that if we wanted to solve all these use after free problems. So it turns out though that Cherry does have the properties you need to be able to look at any piece of memory and say, is this a pointer? Um, because there is a there's a tag associated with the capability in memory. You can check the tag when you say, oh, okay, this is a pointer. And also, we can see which allocation it belonged to. So if we have a list of allocations to revoke, we can reliably revoke every pointer in the system um, to that allocation, um, whether it's in registers, whether it's laying around on the stack um, after return or, or whatever. And so because we can identify that, um, our work on Cornucopia uh, allowed us to revoke capabilities efficiently. So we quarantine them after free. Which is so they don't get you don't you can't get one back until we've revoked it and then periodically we will call a revoke which scans all of memory, um, and uh, finds all the pointers that have been revoked, and then um, depending on the mode of operation either sets them to null, clears their tag, um, there's a couple other options. But, uh, what what sort of um, overhead does something like that have? So one of the problems with Cornucopia is that the actual scanning is not bad. It's, it's a few percent if you do it in a separate background thread. Um, where 
In the current implementation though, at some point you have to synchronize all the threads, cause them to enter the kernel and then do a final scan. And that the pause times on hardware were a bit long. Um, so we have some work in progress. Um, a recent blog from Microsoft Research talked about uh, the, the ongoing work there where we're changing things so that when we load a capability out of a page that hasn't been scanned, we make sure that we, we, we intercept that. And if it's a capability that needs to be revoked, we revoke it before letting the kernel, let, letting the user space have it. And that should let us cut down dramatically on pause times and uh, hopefully will be enough to improve performance uh, to the point that you won't have to carefully hide um, your revocation. Uh, we're also interested in the possibility of looking at places in uh, programs, especially interactive programs, where you can sensibly hide um, the cost of revocation, mm. um, where a small pause won't be noticeable, you're already waiting. 